Welcome to the Mark Steiner Show here on The Real News. I'm Mark Steiner, and it's great to have you all with us. Whiteness and the power of it. Racism, the insidious power that defines this country. And in our society, it seems to permeate everything. But what happens when you wrestle with that on a personal level? When you know your family not only were enslavers, but took part in lynchings, and who are power brokers who instituted segregation in the wake of Reconstruction's demise, in the uncertain future after the end of slavery. Well, my friend and colleague Baynard Woods did just that in his new book, Inheritance, an Autobiography of Whiteness. He grew up in South Carolina. He's a writer whose work has appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, many other publications, and co-wrote with Brandon Soderbergh the book, I Got a Monster, The Rise and Fall of America's Most Corrupt Police Squad. And he joins us now to talk about his book, Inheritance. Baynard, welcome. Good to have you with us. Great to be here and great to be back. He left out that I also uh, worked at The Real News in the past, oh, so it's happy that, to be did here. Did I leave that out? Well, it, it, You worked at The Real News? I'm just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm happy to be, it's great to be back in here. It's good to have you here. Yeah. So let's just begin with, with um, the obvious question everybody asks about your cover. Well, yeah, so I cross out my byline on the the front of the book and then throughout the book on the top of the page and whenever I have control over it because, uh, you know, I, I'd been writing for a long time and realized in reporting this that my name stood above every story that I ever wrote like a Confederate monument. I'm reporting on Black Lives Matter and here is a Confederate monument above it. Baynard, the Baynard family in, in uh, 1860 believed that they owned about 700 something people. Uh, the Woods family also believed that they owned people at that time. And this goes back for hundreds and hundreds of years with both of those families. Uh, and then with, with other really shameful history that we'll get into after that. And so I thought there's no way that I can continue to use that name like that. Uh, on the other hand, it's my name. And I didn't feel I could change it without continuing the cover-up that made me be unaware of it anyway. It would be like going in disguise and sneaking out of town. So instead, what I did was I crossed it out as something like crime scene tape uh, to draw a line around it as full disclosure of the crimes involved in the name uh, and the way that they may have infected me. And I also did it in using the the tools of French deconstruction. They have a technique called putting a word under erasure or surateur where they cross it out like that. And it says that it's a necessary word, but it is inadequate to, to deal with what it's trying to deal with being, for instance. A, a word can't capture that. So they, they cross through it. And so I wanted to put that in at the ends of American Reconstruction and how we can try to create a multiracial democracy out of this uh, white supremacist oligarchical country we have. Uh, it is a slight digression, but I was really thinking about this this morning again as I was going through the book again and kind of taking some notes again. We, we talk about racism in America a lot. Um, some of us do anyway, and really wrestle with that. But the term and the notion of whiteness seems to have grabbed, especially your generation, and, and generations that came after the civil rights movement, to wrestle with this notion of whiteness. Well, why do you think that is? What do you think that means? Yeah, it's a, a fascinating question. And I think, so in your generation, my parents grew up in South Carolina about the same age, and every door they walked in in a public space said white or whites only. And then right about the time I was born, they, after the Civil Rights Act, those signs were gone. And so they said, we just don't talk about that anymore. That's just not something we're going to say. And then you have people like Donald Trump saying, I don't have a racist bone in my body. And so instead of having, you know, Bull Connor and uh, George Wallace saying segregation now, segregation forever, uh, you have people saying, oh, I'm just I'm not racist while still enacting racist policies. So saying racist allows someone to say, I'm not racist. Uh, it was, it was just like that woman that you, you, you talk about in the book. You went to this, maybe it was NASCAR, it was a rally, I forget which exact moment, when she, showed, when she was clearly a racist uh, and showed you this picture of her black grandchild. <laughs> It was at the right? Tea Party rally. Tea Party, tea party rally. Where the bunch was. of people right, 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 almost right, right. assaulting mm -hmm. uh, um, interracial couple uh, sitting there with a sign that said outlaw white supremacy. Uh, and then, yeah, she was very intent on showing me that she had a black granddaughter and that meant she wasn't racist. 
But the thing is, is whiteness was only invented as white supremacy. There's never been a notion of whiteness separate from white supremacy. So if we talk about whiteness, you don't have Donald Trump saying, I don't have a white bone in my body. Uh, <laughs> And so it's a way to talk about that it's it's functioning. Racism isn't just a thing that happens when you're a Bull Connor or a Klansman being actively and openly and intentionally racist. It's a larger conspiracy that structures our entire society. And so in order for me to figure out the ways in which I am racist, then I had to figure out the way that whiteness worked in me. I think of like Kwame Ture had that line that uh, when you look at a black man, there's you see a black man. When you look at a white man, you see the army and the navy and all of this behind him. And and so I wanted to see where how that army and navy uh, had its tentacles in in my own thinking. And for folks who who not sure who Kwame Ture is, he used to be Silky Carmichael. Then he changed his name to Kwame Ture. Since we're talking about changing names and stuff, yes. I had to go with the the <laughs> yeah, yeah, latter no, most of the name. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Just want yeah. folks to know who you were talking about. To be clear, because um, many folks don't know. So it's you know it's like you. Um, I'm going to read a few things in this book as we go through this, and 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 this kind of fits what you were just saying. You wrote at the earlier in the book, I'd come to see whiteness, the system of power governing mom and dad's idea of success, as a way to cheat, a false criterion of value. But whiteness is also a lie. We tell ourselves to save face when we have failed. Whiteness is the willingness to replace reality with a myth in order to protect our perceived worth. I mean, so we, each piece of this book was, was fascinating to me because it's the end of every chapter has a different aspect of your struggling with this notion of whiteness. You really kind of, it's your p progression in figuring out who I am as a human being and why do I think this way and what is this legacy of the Confederacy and slavery and what my family did over these hundreds of years really mean. Yeah, and for most of my life, I didn't have to think about it in terms of race or whiteness. I think the first one of those that ends at the first chapter is, uh, for most of my life, whiteness was the freedom not to think about race. Right. And only in rare instances you would feel, oh, I'm white, I'm different than people around me or whatever. And and then almost immediately we'd be able to go back into the not thinking of it. And that's, again, why I wanted to use the word whiteness rather than racism is, is that we were so uncomfortable to talk about our own whiteness. And even white people who are progressive can talk about, oh, those Trumpists and stuff are racist, uh, but not us. Uh, it's, it's only in, in down south and it's only people whose family were here in the Civil War and it's only, uh, but thinking about the way that we always want to, we become so uncomfortable every time we have to to think about it was just on display every day with, with the backlash to 1619 Project, the backlash to critical race theory, you know, forever when we had Black History Month, you had always some white jerk in class be like, well, when are we going to have White History Month? <laughs> right. And what ends up happening, we have white history and they immediately outlaw it because what we actually don't want is White History Month. We do want White Mythology Month, uh, but that's every <laughs> month in America. So what we, we end up with is outlawing talking about whiteness at all. So I, it, let's talk in a broader frame about this one question we're going to get into a little bit more detail, but it is, you are wrestling with your shift in consciousness, all the forms it took, especially you. I mean, I didn't mean you necessarily, Baynard Woods, but especially you, Baynard Woods, because you grew up in South Carolina, because you have this family history. Um, I mean, the 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 legacy of I am Woods, your great grandfather, yeah. is permeates the book. It, it's even when his name's not mentioned, you feel him throughout the entire book. Um, and, and what that is like, I mean, because well, we're both white, um, but we come at this from very, very different places. So let's talk a bit about that. I mean, I'm just, it's just that, that how difficult it was and what it meant for this opening to happen in, in its own way, slowly, but profoundly. Yeah. Now, when I think back on it, it's such a strange world to grow up in. So I grew up in Columbia, South Carolina, or right outside of Columbia, South Carolina, uh, in the 70s and 80s. And I heard far more about the Civil War than civil rights. 
and which had been very recent. But all of the talk now, I think, about the Civil War was very much of it was code about civil rights. And we never talked about race when we talked about it. The enemy was the Yankees. And so that had this sort of thing of people migrating to the South from the North also. And how oh, the Yankees come here and ruin everything. But also like, oh, they ruined everything in 1860s. They ruined everything again in the 1960s. States' rights. It was, you know, the, the Confederate flag flapped above the state capitol. Uh, there are these gold stars on its dome showing where Sherman's cannonballs hit it. And one of my earliest memories is my mom telling me I was there with her as a kid feeding the squirrels and whatever. And there's a statue of George Washington in front of the state house and it's holding a cane and the cane is broken. And my mom told me, well, the Yankees who came, they hated freedom so much that they stoned the father of our country. Uh, and I realized that she was getting that from the plaque as I, I later learned that was on the, you know, on the plinth of the statue and it's completely false. This, the cane was broken moving the statue. Just a complete lie. Uh, and so you have that going on mixed with this weird countercultural uh, thing with like my favorite show is the Dukes of Hazard and Smokey and the Bandit, where you see this countercultural distrust of authority being merged and melded with rebellion of the Confederacy. And so the rebel flag marking rebellion of the dope smoking variety or whatever, also uh, <laughs> our moonshine running or right. whatever. <laughs> and, and so it was a, a really weird, false world, mythological world that they tried to bring me up in. And yet my dad was also the biggest company man you could imagine and the biggest, uh, you know, proponent of the system in America and you have to work hard and it will pay off. And it, and so it was just full of, of contradictions. You know, there was never a time that I didn't know that my family were enslavers. I always knew that. But there was most of much of my life I didn't know what that meant and how utterly horrendous and totalitarian and... um truly evil that was and so yeah that 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 was something that's been a really the real discovery was having to think through and i think we all are still needing to do this what that meant for the white people who felt like they somehow deserved to own people and that in order to do that, they were willing to use any means necessary, extreme, extreme force, extreme control, extreme surveillance. And all of that, I didn't know while being talked to about the Civil War and the antebellum period and all of that stuff all the time. So this might be a good time, since I mentioned his name earlier and what you just said, to bring in your great-grandfather. Let's talk a bit about him before I go back into reading the book reading from the book, sure. I Am Woods and, and, and the legacy he left and who he was and why he played such a powerful role in the psyche of your family and yours. Yeah, so my great-grandfather uh, was named Irvin McSwain Woods, I Am Woods, and he's so fascinating to me because he was born in 1842, so he turned 18 the year the war started. He had a chance to change. He had a, a, an ability to see different. It wasn't even a generation, two generations before living in some small, isolated place. You could maybe make more of an argument. He was a man of his time and that kind of stuff. But this guy, the times were, were uh, changing, and he could have done any number of things, as people did, scalawags in the South who supported. But instead, he went and fought uh, for the Confederacy. He came back, became a... Klansman terrorist was involved in the assassination of a black county commissioner named Peter Lemon in, in 1871, had to flee the state of South Carolina and hide out for a while, came back and was elected to the state legislature and helped uh, pass Jim Crow laws, was in the legislature for a while, and the laws that that created the Jim Crow system and segregation. And so it it you know, I was I was taught to revere him, like, oh, you had family who fought in this big historic event. He was wounded at Gettysburg. He was a legislator. There's a plaque to him in, in a courthouse. Uh, and there was nothing more complicated that was shared with me about what his legacy was. And 
until I was 25. And my dad told me, oh, well, he ran away and had to hide out um, for a while because he killed a black man. And that's the only details he had. And so for me, then I had a mystery story that was I knew the culprit and I didn't know the victim. And it became important for me to find out who he had killed, partly because the mass crimes of enslavement were so vast that I didn't know how to get my head around it. The way that enslaving families would marry enslaving families back and back. And my family came in the 1600s. So thousands and thousands of people. And then, you know, after that, the, the mass harm of Jim Crow in South Carolina and the generations of that. So this one brief period of during the reconstruction period, these, these, Acts that he did were considered crimes. And in the period before and after, they weren't considered crimes. And so by focusing on the, the crime of that period, I hoped it would help me find a way in to the greater miasma of uh, criminality that, that created their entire lives. The, the journey you took in this, it, it just, it, it, it's amazing. And I, it's, it, it, blows, it blew my mind to read it because it's a, it, 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 at the end of each chapter, the way you kind of bring it to a place where this is what I have to wrestle with, this is what we have to wrestle with, um, uh, the, 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 you, you have this great thing here when you were, the, the, the woman you were with, I guess, before you met the incredible Nicole, <laughs> who is your wife, um, also from South Carolina, and um, it takes place in a strip club. And you said, I'll just read this piece and talk sure. about it, all right? So me and Candy, a white girl, and Cyrita, who you know is black, were talking, talking at work one night. Candy said her parents were racist, weren't racist, because her mom had been raised by a black woman. Blake, who was your girlfriend then, said, Cyrita laughed so hard she spit out her drink. Your mama is just like the men who come in here and believe we love them. I laughed, but I recognized something I didn't notice before, something about how the strip club worked. The men who went in there, in, went, the men who went in there weren't praying for a naked body. They were paying for a flattering fantasy. They wanted to believe the woman would want to spend time with them, even if they had, hadn't been working as strippers. It reminded me of my grandmother Wood's illusion that Africans were happy to have been enslaved, She'd tell me how lucky they were to have been brought over to America and how much they loved old Mars. The fantasy of love in this sort of racism is not incidental. It is an essential feature. If we can tell ourselves that the people who oppress us love us and are happy about it, then we can justify that oppression. I mean, the idea of taking a strip club and, making an, <laughs> and showing the analogy between oppression of women and the strip club and that of, of black folks in America was really interesting. And, and as you answer that, talk about that, talk about when you really came to that realization. I mean, I guess I came to the realization in, in that moment of when I first heard the story, but as with so many things in this book, you have a brief realization and then the way whiteness works like a, a tide, it washes it away quickly. <laughs> and so you're no longer aware because uh, my own sexism and racism and stuff was, was, uh, what I'd been raised in and felt safer than something other than that. But it did really strike. My mother always would tell me stories about having been raised by a woman named Slim. And uh, her mother was, was generally a very pretty cold person. And I started to realize that my grandmother outsourced the love of her children to this black woman and but my mom then gained something else through that that was also part of what I think my grandparents were paying for, the sense that like, oh, well, I understand black people and they didn't, the things weren't hard for them then. Really slim told me that, you know, and it's like, well, they weren't in a position to tell you the truth. How many, how many employees tell their boss how much they hate the job? Um, why was, you know, take this job and shove it such a big hit <laughs> because everyone wants to tell their boss to go to hell. Um, and it's the same in that situation, but the power dynamics were even so much different and so much worse. I mean, things that we don't 
think about in that period. Like my mom would say in Greenville, oh, when they tried to make Slim go to the back of the bus, I insisted on going with her, but she wouldn't let me because it would make it worse for her. And it's not like I don't believe her um, with that, but I think she had no way to have an accurate view of what was happening. And I think they've blocked out. I asked her, there was a TV movie last time I saw her on, on uh about Emmett Till, and so I asked her and and my mother-in-law, so what do y'all remember about this? And, oh, nothing, absolutely nothing at all. Um, and I do find that hard to believe, but I feel like they block it out because they don't want to see it, or they didn't have to see it, that every person of color would have to step off of the sidewalk to let a white person pass in their town. I think they didn't even notice that. Unless someone didn't, and then they noticed it. But as long as it happened according to the way it was supposed to happen, they didn't notice it. And similarly with, so for instance, I was living off of uh, Blake in that situation. She was paying me the money she was making. I got to go off and be, um, you know, romantic Percy Shelley writer or whatever, while she was a better writer than I, and she was working. And, and you know, it was really in in my interest to not think too deeply about the dynamics of that situation. <laughs> but you have thought about it now, obviously. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah right, certainly. Right. It's in the book. Um, so, you know, um, there's so much here. That, and it's, it is really difficult sometimes to figure out what not to read. I could read the whole book, but then you, you wouldn't read it yourself, what you need to do, my uh, people who are watching or listening to this. Um, but th th I was thinking about how these legacies symbolically never leave us. And I thought about it in terms of the ring that I see in Nicole's hand all the time and realizing you, when you wrote about this ring, the legacy of that ring, how the, 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 the engagement ring itself is, is, is wrapped up in enslavement, wrapped up in the history of America, and it's wrapped up between the two of you and it's wrapped up in your lives as South Carolinians. And, th and, that, and that ring is there. Talk a bit about that. I mean, I think that it's, to me, that was like the screaming symbolism of everything that connects us to that madness, to this madness. Yeah. I and mean, especially it being gold and just, it highlights the role of wealth and, and all of this. But um, so when I was proposing to then my girlfriend, Nicole, um, my mom gave me the ring that my dad's father had, my dad's mother had given him to give to her, my mom. And the story was it had been in our family for seven generations. And that was like, oh, I think of pride. That was cool. It was made before there were machines. It was made before, uh, but you know, as I learned in reporting the book, only three generations ago, because my grandfather was sort of a generation older than my grandmother. And so at least on one side of my family, only three generations ago, uh, they were involved in in clan terrorism and and four generations ago were slaveholders and so seven generations what was the horrendous uh abuse and violence and control involved in the production of that ring and in the giving of that ring and it symbolized as i was saying the way that enslaving families would marry enslaving families it was a union between these also at a time when women had very, very few rights. Um, and so there was, there was also the, as I did my rough math, sometime around seven generations ago would have been around the time that Mary Wollstonecraft was writing Vindication of the Rights of Women. And so it, you know, it was a symbol of this woman agreeing to be the property of this man as well, to some extent, a lesser extent uh, than those other people that uh, they she was considering property. And so it was this whole chain of uh, the illusion of ownership of other people and the way that that creates social bonds and also then distorts all of our, our social bonds and all of our, you know, when people say, well, my family were kindly slave owners, I believe. Like that is just <laughs> right, impossible. Right, 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 right. That's just not a possible situation that, that one could have uh, because you believe you own someone that is in itself unkindly uh, relationship. And, and uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, what you're just saying now makes me, you, you, you describe it at another point in the book, 
um, enslavement as a concentration camp and living in the midst of a concentration camp. Not just living in the midst of a concentration camp that was horrendous enough for my family who was killed there for a period of 10 years, whatever that number was, but for generations, generations living, running a, a concentration camp. What that does to your consciousness, what it did to the people that you kept in that concentration camp. Yeah, I mean, and I, I don't want to in any way diminish the, right. the unique uh, evil involved in the Holocaust and the concentration camps in uh, Europe, but I do think that what you said is really important. Like, that was a very, very short-lived regime, uh, you know, of, of 33 to 45. And this was from 1660 in South Carolina, uh, you know, officially, and they were mainly enslaving native people before that. But so from early 16, we'll say 1619, uh, up through 1865, and then you create this heavily, this apartheid system, which was itself too extreme for the Nazi jurists. When they were trying to come up with their race separation laws, they looked at Arkansas and they said, whoa, that's too much. <laughs> we can't no, have that it's kind funny, of... Uh, right, 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 right. Because, you know, they thought that some German blood would help purify uh, Jews from the, the, you know, racially, whereas Americans had the one drop sort of thing. And, and but we're still so different now. The problem is, is we need to adopt more of the model that Germans have have had since then of never again and of really trying to memorialize it and recognize that evil to make it happen. But we had a 400-year totalitarian regime, and we say the South will rise again instead of never again. So it's still, and like you said, it's still, we think of the evil of listening to some beautiful classical music while the concentration camp's going on around outside you. This was the daily life for centuries of my family and of so many of our uh, our families. And people still go to these places to get married today because it's a beautiful sight. Uh, I can't monstrous. Even, I can't even imagine that. Monstrous. I just, I, I can't even imagine that. I mean, so this, this is something you wrote and you were reflecting on what happened in Baltimore. And I'll just start here. So I felt silly, aware of all the things that the people go through, whether reporters covering rural war zones or black people attacked by police in West Baltimore or women terrorized by the sexual violence of men. I knew my trauma was nothing in comparison. And I didn't want to think of myself as the kind of wussy white guy reporter who sees the violence of racism and gets all weak in the knees. But I was. Something was wrong with me. The furies of whiteness were haunting me. I had to expiate the sins of my family, I felt, even while recognizing the absurdity of this quest. At the least, I had to know more precisely what atrocities my family had committed so I could make an accounting of what they had bequeathed to me. In this reflection, I realized that my own name was like a Confederate monument perched above every store, I wrote, and I had to, at the very least, know the miasma the names bore. Online, I started looking through the so-called slave schedules census and tax documents for slavers and the people that they held in bondage. In 1860, I quickly learned the Baynards held 781 people in bondage. The Woodses at the time held only 23 people in bondage. Then the absurdity of my own formulation struck me. In comparison to the 800 people that my grandmother's fam my grandmother family, the Baileys, had enslaved, I found myself using the word only to limit the 23 people the Woodses felt entitled to control in every aspect. I can go on, there's so much here, but thinking about the horrors of slavery, but I mean, so I'd like you to really kind of explore here for everyone what you do in the book as well, what it means for somebody like you coming from that legacy to wrestle with this, to come to the changes you came to and how you got there and how that could translate into something you think may be larger than that. that goes beyond Baynard Woods, but into the society, given everything we're facing, given January the 6th and more. Yeah, so that, maybe I'll, I'll yeah, yeah, walk I'm, through a little I, bit. I threw of, a lot out there, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, yeah, no, I'll I, walk through a little bit. of. So yeah. that, that passage came uh, immediately after Charlottesville. And I had been uh, with my co-writer on I Got a Monster, Brandon Soderbergh, who was working as my editor at the time. We were in the march that the car drove into uh, and killed Heather Heyer. Uh, five years ago this month. And um, 
the, but the amount of violence we saw that day was just extreme and unrelenting from the minute we got there to the minute we left. And it was over the statues, the same statues that I was taught to revere, statues of Lee and Jackson. Um, and it, it gave me, my doctor diagnosed me with PTSD and, uh, you know, but that was the second stage in when Dylan Roof went to Charleston and right after the Baltimore uprising here in 2015 and massacred nine black churchgoers, I, that broke something open in me uh, and made me realize that I, the way that I thought I had escaped South Carolina and all that, that I hadn't and that I couldn't, uh, that we had to confront it and couldn't escape it. He grew up 10 miles from me, Dylan Roof. Uh, that bowl cut he had, like every kid on my street had that haircut when we were growing up. So that it almost felt like that Jordan Peele movie, uh, Us, where part of you gets left behind. You try to repress it and it becomes a distorted, monstrous version of yourself that tries to destroy you. And that was what that felt like, seeing him go to all of these places that I'd seen as a kid, you know, historical sites, but he was treating them as as pilgrimages to go to these Confederate sites and plantation sites before committing this murder uh, and assassination of a, a public official, uh, Clemena Pinckney, the, the preacher in the church, was also a state senator. And so I saw the face of my great-grandfather for the first time in Dylan Roof's face. And I saw my own face in other ways for the first time in that face. And I knew it was something that, that was going to continue to haunt us unless we tried to deal with it. And we have to in a larger political way. And, and so the third thing then that happens after those two is I'm already writing the book, deeply involved in the process, and I'm researching the overthrow of Reconstruction in 1876, in which a group of people called the Red Shirts, who had previously been the Klan, uh, and after that was disbanded by federal law enforcement, they became... Uh, rifle clubs, essentially the Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters, the Proud Boys. And then they all united with these red shirts to storm the Capitol, occupy it, and overthrow the government. And they were successful in a way that um, they weren't successful yet on the January 6th um, attempt to do exactly the same thing. But seeing the ways that these repeated, there's the famous Seamus Haney line that Obama liked a lot and uh, some, that sometimes history and hope rhyme. And I was like, history and hate also rhyme. And we're seeing this happening right now. And so I do think that we need to find um, larger ways to, we can't, white people who want to be better can't just say we're done with it. We've moved up north. We're, we've moved along. Everything's fine. We've got to find ways to dismantle whiteness, which is a, essentially a criminal conspiracy to afford power to us over other people, um, afford power based on our on a racial category that was purely invented. Um, and, and that, thinking of it as a criminal conspiracy helped me because when people say, well, my family didn't own slaves. Well, I'm not like you. Yeah, you, me, South Carolina people are weird. Right. <laughs> or right. my, uh, I wasn't around then, even if my family did. In, in federal law, to be part of a criminal conspiracy, you don't have to have been there at the beginning. You don't have to have been an instituting member of it. And in fact, you don't even have to benefit. Think of all the mobsters who were, thought they were going to benefit by a conspiracy and are instead the bottom of a river or whatever. Um and so it's not saying that white people have had perfect lives, as a lot of people have sort of asked, but it's saying that we hold on to a hierarchical system that is intended to benefit us. In fact, it, it is intended to just control all of us. And so that's the other thing that can maybe, if we start to try to abolish whiteness, the way that it works in our own psychology, we might also see that it doesn't benefit us at all. You know. If we look at it as a zero sum, are we better than better off than black people are under this? Then sure, maybe. But if we look at it uh, 
actually are we being benefited? We're being greatly harmed every day here in Baltimore. Imagine what the city would be without the racist drug war and all of the racist policies that divide our city, spend all of the funding on police, on imprisonment. Um, you know, when I got arrested in South Carolina for smoking weed in the late 80s, I got off a lot easier than a person of color would have. But it had it not been for the racist drug war, I wouldn't have been arrested in the first place. And those resources could have been used to making our community a much better community. Uh, Jonathan Metzl writes about this in Dying of Whiteness and uh, Heather McGee in The Sum of Us. And, and her example is great, how the white people would rather fill in a swimming pool uh, than share the swimming pool. And so the white kids aren't able to swim either. And that's what whiteness does to us. Um, but, but we have to see it clearly and think about what it's done to our psychology in order to have any hope of overcoming it, because we have to fight it directly rather than just say, I'm moving on from it. So I was thinking <clears throat> about you presenting this book and the places you present this book and the conversations you have about this book. And I was thinking about um, a good friend of mine who I actually sent this book to. His name is Hyde Thurman. Oh, we, I've spoken with him before on our old podcast. Yes. Go on a All right. So Hi is, is an old friend. He was one of the leaders of the Young Patriots, which is a Southern white movement in Chicago in the 60s. They made alliance with the Panthers, the Young Lords, and Brown Berets, and the Red Guard in the original Rainbow Coalition. And he's now back in Alabama <clears throat> and organizing in Alabama across uh, and in, in the white community and across, and across racial lines. So I, I wonder... You know, you, when people write, when you write this book, and I think about High's life and your life, they're different. I mean, he grew up as a poor working class kid in Appalachia, and you grew up in, the, in, in South Carolina, very different ways, but embedded in that culture. So taking a book like this and these ideas and taking them beyond um, us, having these conversations with, quote unquote, kindred spirits, how do you think that would, how do you think that would play? How does it play in your family? Yeah, those are great questions. And I mean, what I'm hoping for, what who I wrote the book for is somebody like Dylan Roof or my friend in the book, uh, you know, who gets sent white supremacist pamphlets from David Duke and whose family was worse off than mine. And so he's like, yeah, of course, you don't have to see this because you're getting the benefits, but I'm not. And I want them. And by holding on to whiteness as a way to get them. And I think that that is, it's absolutely necessary. Um, I mean, I put a lot of sex, drugs, and rock and roll and stuff you did. in the book. We didn't talk about that yet. Partly because it's <laughs> that's the contours of my life. Right. Uh, and also partly because uh, I want the kids of the people out there who are, are banning CRT to be sneaking the book, uh, you know, under the covers at night and reading it. And, you know, that's who I want to get is... is uh, you know, Tucker Carlson's kids. <laughs> and I talk. Uh, and, you know, but I'm, I'm, I do think one of the huge problems of the left or the so-called left and, and the centrist Democrats and whatever too, is you don't see a lot of organizing at NASCAR races and at, at um, gun shows. You do, there are a couple of things like John Brown Gun Club and Redneck Revolt that are really doing this kind of organizing and work because the reality is, is that there's the situation of the people who are so angry and that Trump has got does suck. It isn't a great situation for them. And Trump and the Trumpists are able to tell them that it's people of color, it's immigrants, it's uh, women, it's affirmative action. All these things is what's making your life suck instead of income inequality. The Democrats are giving them nothing there. They're telling them, well, the world doesn't really suck. And they all they hear them saying is, look, it, it doesn't suck for you because you're the one with the privilege. And so you and we're giving them nothing to believe in, nothing to fight for. The Democrats have become purely managers for the most part. And it's self-serving. I mean, the reality is, is Biden and Pelosi and stuff, I think, would infinitely rather have Trump than uh, Bernie. Because if they have Trump, then they're hashtag resistance instead of just being career hacks. Uh, 
who have done nothing but start wars and and lock people up all of their lives. And so now they're suddenly heroes and like the French resistance, uh, whereas if they have Bernie, then they just look like corporate hacks. And so they'd infinitely rather get to cosplay resistance um, than have to actually address their own uh, and their, their corporate interests and all of that. And so just by saying, we're just not going to let anything worse. The Democrats have become the party of we're not as bad as those guys. And we have to offer something that says we can get beyond this. And this is where white people shouldn't be scared to talk to your families about this. Although, you know, someone asked me the other day, do you have any tips on talking to your family after writing this book? It's like, no, I had to write a book because I'm terrible at talking to my family. It's hard to talk to your family, even without race, even without like talking to your mom can suck sometimes. And especially having hard conversations. And, you're, what? Are you, oh. and it's so much harder than talking to someone else, but you're able to free them from an ideology that they're not even aware that they have. And so it's like talking to them about the vaccine or something. It is a deadly thing that will kill them, and, and we have to do it. And it's not that we're doing it to school them. Like, I always come to everyone. I'm coming to you from a position of, of deeply flawed. I'm, I'm a, a tremendously flawed person, and I'm not. This isn't white fragility. It's not a, a human resources manual. White fragility <laughs> has great ideas in it, but it it feels a little bit like you've been taken to the principal's office and there's a lot of people that's just never going to reach. And the great academic work that people are doing on race is also a lot of things is the kind of thing that is not going to reach a lot of people. And, and so that was one of the reasons I did this, wrote the book like this as a story was to really try to uh, come to you from where you are. Like I'm also fucked up. And we we have to acknowledge that we're fucked up and that we make mistakes because it's the same with men with sexism. If we just pretend that we're better and harbor all of the stuff in us, we're not actually going to get better ourselves, but we're also not going to provide models for the people who are younger than us of how to move forward, how to come out of this place in your life where you're you're part of this ideology and how to move beyond that ideology and go through the really difficult work of trying to dismantle it in yourself. Oof. I have a, a dozen more things we could talk about, but after that that riff, man, we should just shut up. <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, that was, that, was, that was good. No, I, I think that, you know, I think it's important people realize this book also was, is this personal journey. It's about you and your father, you and your family. And, and and his passing from Lou Gehrig's disease and 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 uh, the, his becoming a Trump person and you're wrestling with him about all this and also your deep love for him at the same time and I think that's the complexity of our existence which this book really does touch upon um, and makes us wrestle less about whiteness but our own humanity and I think that's really important I think that this is and and I and what you said earlier about fragility a moment ago. I argue with people about this all the time. Fragility is not a way to organize people talking about fragility, but talking about the stuff you talk about, which is the reality of 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 what racism does. And this line you have, where is it? Well, there's so much in here to talk about, but like the ghost we never got to, but that's an important piece. The ghost of the black girl in that house. Um, you, the, your line, whiteness is a moral pollution that demands expiation. I had to unravel the details of the murder my great-grandfather had committed and all of how it's wrapped up in where we are now, the end of Reconstruction and what that, what that brought to us, but wrapped up in this personal story is a really unique way of doing it. Yeah, and I mean, the it's such a tough thing when you're dealing with people that you love. You know, one of the things I noticed was that when white people talked about racism now we talk about structural racism again because we don't people aren't generally as willing although they've become much more so in recent years to be the the uh bull connor types or whatever but we so we talk about oh it's structural but then that lets us off the hook so we have to realize that it's structural but we can't just be like oh it's structural racism so you know and then but that's what most white people do is then go on with their business uh, but that structure means that it intersects with all of the love in your life, with so many people that you care about, so many of the fond memories that you have, so many of the uh, people that you do love. And, and you can't 
just abandon those people because you disagree with them because unless that might help to sway them over because those people can then aid to and cause harm to others. Right. Um, I mean, once my, once my dad was on his deathbed and he died while I was writing the book, I, I gave myself just to caring for him and then working in his hometown of Clarendon County to try to figure out what I could do to undo the murder of, not undo the murder of Peter Lemon, but recognize uh, my great grandfather's murder of Peter Lemon and memorialize it and and care for my dad. But when he was still able to cause harm and he was still able to vote for Trump or whatever, it was my job to argue with him as much as I could uh, because I had to play defense to try to stop that harm in the same way that the anti fascist in Charlottesville, to come back to that, you know, when the car drove into the crowd, they'd already driven the racists out of town, the white supremacists out of town. For the most part, and there was a rumor that they were going to regroup and attack a black apartment complex. And when they marched over, there was a discussion like, and it wasn't about that you needed white saviors to go save this apartment complex from the Nazis. You, you didn't. But it was like these people who live in this apartment complex should get to enjoy their Saturday without having to worry about the Nazis coming there. So we're going to go get in the middle. And like, that's a role we can play with our families. And you know, that that moral pollution that needs expiation line, I desperately wanted the book to be called Miasma, wow. which in ancient Greek was an inherited curse, the curse of the house of Atreus that goes down and, uh, and a, a curse that's passed on from generation to generation. And it was also the word that the slavers in South Carolina called the mists that would rise up from the marsh. Because they were into uh, Greek culture and Roman culture. They were deeply into it. And they thought that was what caused malaria, right. you know, bad air, mal air. And they didn't know about the mosquitoes. So they would leave their plantations in the summertime, leaving the Africans there, often under Muslim uh, overseers, which was an interesting sort of dynamic that allowed African culture to remain more intact. Um, but it, it seemed like the perfect symbol of the, the inherited curse that I had gotten. And so trying to figure out that curse um, and how it worked was, was an important part of the book. And I mean, one of the things I was most horrified to notice was the slave codes in, in, of 1740 in South Carolina after the Stono Rebellion in 1739 really delineated two purposes of law, that law protected white people without binding us and bound black people without protecting them. And when I saw that that logic permeated my own psychology when I was young and was driving drunk and crashed into the car of an older black driver, and my grandfather got me off uh, because of knowing the cops, I was enacting the same logic of the slave codes of 1740. When Amy Cooper was breaking the law in 2020 by walking her dog without a leash in Central Park, and Christian Cooper was uh, following the law, watching birds there, and he asked her to obey the law, she immediately called the police on him because her belief was the law, her unconscious belief was the law is supposed to protect her and bind him. And that comes directly from the slave codes of 1740. And so we have to really... Uh, think about the way that these centuries of totalitarian rule have warped our own uh, sense of the world and made us see the world in really inaccurate ways. And so no wonder we have people clamoring for authoritarian rule, warning authoritarian rule, um, because we still have not ever addressed this kind of uh, totalitarian mindset that we maintain. All I can say right now is... Phew. Thank you. I really mean it. And this is a really important book, folks. It's a really important book. And one that um, I would encourage folks to read, and wrestle with, uh, with family and friends and more. Uh, Inheritance, an autobiography of whiteness by Baynard Woods. Um, and it, it it is of the moment, what we all have to wrestle with and think about what we're facing. So, Bay, thanks for coming here. Uh, really good to see you, man. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Mark. It's great to sit here and talk always with good you. To talk. Always, yeah. always, always, with or without a beer. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> thanks. Good to have you here. And once again, Baynard Woods, thanks so much for joining us. Good to have you here with us today. And this book, Inheritance, an autobiography of whiteness, is well worth the read for any of you out there, and to, with your friends, to sit and talk about it. It kind of wrestles with who we are as Americans and well worth getting into. So, 
please write to me here at mss at therealnews.com. Let me know what you thought about today's program and what you'd like us to cover, and I will write you right back, and we'll go back and forth and see what we can do about all that. And so with the folks here at The Real News, Dwayne Gladden, Kel Rivera, Stephen Frank, who make this show hum, I'm Mark Steiner for The Real News Network. Thanks for joining us, and take care.